All right, well, welcome back, everyone, from lunch. I hope some, everyone got a chance to eat and get some refreshments. And uh, in front of your desk is our giveaway. I don't know how many of you folks travel, uh, but uh, uh, this was the sleep mask that Jeff told me to get, and I bought it right away along with those uh, blue light blockers. And so I think we're in for a special treat. Um, so I was at a conference, and I heard Jeff speak. And he was marauded by people like, give me that link, give me that link. I'm just buying it right now. Because who wants better or more sleep? Right? It's like universal. And, uh, you know, I talked about there used to be like standing desks, yoga, meditation, but now it's all about sleep. And Jeff will make a conclusive case for why it's important. And um, the, the crazy thing about Jeff is the reason we're going to do him remotely is because he's not getting enough sleep because he has a newborn right now. But he's still willing to carve out time to zoom in with us. And um, he caught everyone's attention at the CEO summit I went to is because his company did research that helped the University of Alabama win championships. He did consulting at the University, University of Michigan. Uh, I think uh, the pro sports as well. Everyone wanted more sleep, and it impacted their performance. So it was just a madhouse of people just asking Jeff for advice and questions. So I'm going to have Slido open so you folks can pop in questions. He can't really see us that well because he's on Zoom, but he's going to be with us for 20 minutes, and then we're going to transition to Q&A. So with that, let's give a great, warm welcome to Jeff Kahn. Hey. Am I, I'm up on the screen. Is that right, David? You're up and live. Awesome, awesome. Hey, it's really such a pleasure to be able to be in front of everyone. And it is a little weird not being able to see you uh, so well, but I do feel the presence and I feel the energy and, and uh, thanks, thanks for the claps. But I am sitting here in my office uh, in Chicago and hopefully we'll get to have the same sort of engagement and same sort of fun that we get to have in person. Um, and so what I'd like to do, we've got, as David mentioned, we've got you know 30 minutes together. Um, and the way that I think we can spend that time first is just, you guys know how important sleep is. You've, you've probably heard about it. Obviously, you spend a significant amount of your time doing it. I want to give you just the most important takeaway from the last 100 years of sleep science. So, and that concept is called sleep debt, and we'll get, we'll get pretty deep into that one topic. Um, second, you know, we're all in the business of really making sure that our employees are coming to work healthy, they're happy, super high-performing, productive, engaged. How does this actually translate into a business setting? Um, as David mentioned, I, I did actually start and, and Rise started our work uh, back with uh, professional athletic teams and, and some of those that, that David mentioned. Um, but really the focus now is what, how does this translate into, into business? How does it help lead to different results? Um, and then lastly, we'll have time for Q&A. Tons of questions personally, uh, maybe have questions too about how this might work in a business setting. So really, really excited to, to make that happen. Um, now, before we really get into those topics, I really just want to share with you how I got into this. And I want to take you back to 2011. I was a second year uh, in, in undergrad studying engineering, up late at night, pounding the books, up early in the morning, and just feeling terrible. I didn't really know why, but I thought maybe, just maybe, it had to do with my sleep. Um, and I ended up taking some independent studies, specifically in sleep science, because there were no classes actually offered. Um, and I was I really had the great fortune to work with some of the best researchers in the field, which is interesting, there were no classes offered, but some of the best researchers um, over, over at Northwestern. And about a year into that study, I really realized, and I wasn't the first to, to realize this, but I realized that sleep is the most potent performance enhancing and life giving drug that we know of. And I want to give you kind of a, a really deeper dive on like, what does that mean, like drug? Uh, what would a world look like where sleep was this drug? And I want you to take a moment just to imagine a reality where there was a drug that I told you about that if you took it most days, you would live longer. You'd be protected from most chronic disease, from most chronic disease states. And within a week, you'd notice that almost every aspect of your functioning and quality of life would dramatically improve. So cognitively, you'd start to notice more focus and flow. You'd have more creativity and productivity your learning skills and memory would improve. In that same week, you'd start to notice emotionally, you'd be during your days happier, less depressed, less anxious, you'd have more empathy, and the list goes on here. Uh, this is an entire field of study just within sleep science. These are 
these are just a couple of the things that you'd feel physically you'd notice that your skin is the healthiest it's ever been your metabolism would be 30 percent faster you'd crave less uh, unhealthy foods you'd find you'd have more willpower you'd have higher libido you'd get you know you'd be 300 percent less likely to just catch the common cold uh, it, it's just it's really really mind-blowing and at this point you should absolutely be skeptical like it sounds crazy um but i am a person of evidence or i consider myself a person of evidence and what that means is that I am willing to listen to a claim, and this is a massive claim, by the way, uh, but it just means that we need to have greater evidence behind it. And there are two really fascinating points that convince me that there is a significant amount of evidence behind this. Um, the first is that we've actually started studying sleep back in 1925 at the University of Chicago, which is where the very first sleep lab opened. And just to give you a bit of context, that's about three years before penicillin, the first antibiotic, was even ever discovered, uh, let alone brought to market in the mid-1940s during uh, the end of World War II. Uh, to give you another point, there's about 1.2 million papers that are cited really within the research community uh, talk about sleep. There's about half that for exercise. So there's all this talk about exercise and how important it is. We spend time doing it, yet there, there, we know way more about, about how important sleep is, and we've been studying it for far, far longer. Now, uh, the problem is with this that uh, the last 100 years or so, we've stopped taking this drug called sleep, right? And the problem really is we need a little over eight. We're getting a little, a little over six. And that's really what's creating, you know, a, a lot of these issues that we've got today and wh why this epidemic is so large. And it's really that problem that led me to get involved in starting a business whose mission it is, is to provide everyone these tools to get back to healthy sleep. This is something we used to do. Uh, it's just something today that's, that's incredibly hard. Now, all these uh, benefits that I just had up on the screen here, and I'm sure you've heard many more as well, uh, they all happen because of w really one measure. And it's not how much sleep you got last night. It's not what your tracker says. It's not how much REM sleep you got or deep sleep or what your sleep quality was or if you woke up. The really only measure we know of the last 100 years of sleep science that will have any predictive power over whether or not you're going to feel the benefits of sleep is sleep debt. And so that's really what I want to start talking to you now about is how does this work? How does it impact you? Um, and the way this works is pretty simple, actually. Um, we each have a different amount of sleep we need, and it's a genetic trait just like eye color um, or, or any other genetic trait that we got. Um, there are some folks that need five hours, although that's very rare. Some folks that need seven, you know, on the, on the seven-hour end of things. Some folks that need, you know, almost nine and a half. Uh, for those of us that are statistically inclined, the average need is eight hours and ten minutes with a 35-minute standard deviation. What that means is basically most of us need somewhere between seven and a half and eight and a half. Uh, yes, there are people that need nine and your friends that say that they need six. Uh, there are very few of them, um, but most of us need somewhere between seven and a half and eight and a half. And once we hit about 18, that need doesn't change a ton. Now, if you don't get that amount of sleep each night, you build up something called sleep debt, which is what we've been talking about. So how does this work? Well, I want to show you one of my favorite research studies from all of sleep science that really talks about how, this, how, how, the, how sleep debt happens over time and how it affects our performance. So there's a lot on this slide, but I want to break it down for you step by step. So the way this works, let's see, I'm gonna, can you, I think you should be able to see my mouse cursor here hovering over the top right of the graph. So we've got a nine hour group, a seven hour group, a five hour group, and a three hour group. And by group, it's just a group of people um, assigned to get that amount of sleep, or assigned to get that amount of time in bed. Now, on the x-axis here, there's uh, the day. And what the, what's going on here is this B stands for baseline. So every one of those groups, uh, no matter which group you're in, is getting eight hours of bed. E137, that stands for experimental night. So E137, depending on the group you're in, whoops, we're going to go back to that. Depending on which group you're in, uh, you get that amount of sleep. So on E1, if you're in the nine-hour group, you get nine hours. On E1, if you're in the seven hour group, the triangles, you get seven hours of bed and so forth. Um, and then R1 through R3 stands for recovery. So no matter the group you're in, you get eight hours in bed at night to, to be able to recover. Now on the Y axis here, you'll see something that says mean number of lapses. So what the heck is that? Um, that is just a measure of what scientists call neurocognitive vigilance. Just a fancy word for saying like focus 
and being able to have sustained attention on one particular task. Uh, the way this works is imagine you've got your iPhone in front of you and a uh, box pops up and you need to tap it as fast as you realize the box popped up. A lapse is just taking over 500 milliseconds, so over half a second to respond to that is considered a lapse. And this is really the gold standard measure for looking, uh, for, for being able to assess and measure things like, you know, vigilance and attention and focus. Um, and so what you're seeing here, I'm going to point out a couple different cases. In the nine hour group, you can see basically everything stays the same. No lapses. Uh, everything's pretty good. You can see the seven hour group in bed. Uh, at each night they get seven hours, you can see their, the number of lapses increases each day. And so what does that tell you? Well, look at day seven. It's not just about how much sleep you got, you know, day seven. It actually matters that you've been getting seven hours each day because you can see that building up. Uh, same thing with the five-hour group, right? Each day you get five hours and you need, on average, eight or eight hours and ten. Um, you can see that performance gets worse and worse. It doesn't stay the same. So that's the debt. That's the process of the debt actually building up and really affecting your ability to focus on, on a particular task. Um, and then you can see the three-hour group, same thing sort of happens, but just way crazier over here. Um, the, the, the body is really sensitive once you start getting you know, somewhere between five and three. Now, let's take a look at the recovery nights a little more deeply. What's really fascinating is I think most of, probably every single person uh, in the room right now has had a week, has had seven nights where they've got seven hours. In fact, there's probably many people in the room and uh, just had a, had a uh, baby girl, uh, many, many days where... It, Getting seven hours for a week would be amazing. Um, and what you can see here is just within a week, uh, seven days of, of getting seven hours in bed, you can see that then even getting three nights of eight hours in bed doesn't actually change performance. You don't get back to the nine hour group. Um, same thing happens with the five hour group. You'd think like, oh man, yeah, I've got five hours for a week and maybe it was a really intense week. Now I want to make it up over the weekend. I'm going to get eight hours your performance actually won't, won't really change. And so what's the reason for that? The reason behind that is you're actually not paying back debt. You're just getting the amount that you need. So let's zoom out a little bit on this concept of sleep debt. A couple big takeaways. Um, one is if you've been sleeping, you know, if you get the amount that you need each night, if you've got a big presentation or meeting or something really mission critical that next day, and if you have difficulty that night, not so big of a deal. You know, when we're talking with Dak Prescott at the Cowboys or any one of the, the, the athletes that uh, we used to do a lot of work with, uh, you know, they, they would be really difficult to, to be able to get the sleep you needed to be able to perform, you know, for a huge game in front of millions of people. Um, but if they slept well leading up to that, there, it didn't, didn't really matter if they only had a four-hour night or a three-hour night. Um, now, the opposite of that is also true. If you haven't been sleeping well, and then you say, you know what, on, I, I'm getting five hours through, throughout the whole week, and then on, on Friday night, I'm, I'm going to get you know, eight and a half, or I'm going to get 10. It's not really going to change your performance uh, either. And so you might actually, some people experience getting more than usual. They feel a lot worse. Um, some people actually will, will, will feel better, and there's reasons for both. Happy to talk about that uh, offline and, or online, I guess, in, in the Q&A. Um, and so th those are really kind of the two big pieces. A couple other guardrails to be aware of. So you can build up about 40 hours of sleep debt over about the past month. So when you're thinking about your sleep, it's not just how did I do last night or even the night before. It's really how have we been doing the past month. But the way that this does work is that the, 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 the more recent the night, the more it affects your sleep debt. So I think last night, just to give you a sense, is about if, if um, you know, your sleep debt was, uh, was 100% uh, you know, and over the last month, Last night accounts for maybe 15% of your sleep debt today, just to give you, give you some sense. And to make one more point about the difference in performance between these two groups, like, okay, what's the difference between like, you know, one lapse and four lapses? Um, this is actually the difference between being uh, fully sober and then being at the legal limit for alcohol. So this is actually quite a big difference, um, even though it doesn't look that way, uh, you know, in, presented in, in this paper. So what makes this problem so hard, right? If we knew, if we all knew and felt this, I think it'd be a lot easier to solve. Part of the problem is we don't walk around with some way of knowing what our sleep debt is. It's really hard to keep the last month uh, of, of sleep duration need in our head. Like we just, we don't have that. So it's really hard to know how sleepy you are. And so I wanna show you, give you another example of another study that was done that just talks about how hard it is to even recognize this problem, even when it's hiding in plain sight. So what you can see on the left here same thing that you guys just saw, which is 
you know, you've got an eight hour, six hour, four hour group, we're measuring lapses. And in this case, we're just looking at two weeks of, of getting that. And you can see sort of the same idea. Performance gets worse uh, over time. Now what we're measuring here, this graph, um, is really subjective sleepiness. So it's answering the question, how sleepy do you feel? To give you some idea, a two is uh, reporting feeling slightly sleepy. So what does this mean? If you've got, uh, if you talk to someone and that's not, fe maybe they're not feeling so great and they've been getting six or four hours, they sleep by day three, they're only going to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm only slightly sleepy and it doesn't really change uh, as they continue to get that amount of sleep, even though their performance is getting worse. Now this isn't just focus, this is emotions, this is physical, this is cognitive. So, you know, not only are you going to feel like it's going to be hard to focus, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to be crabbier at work, you're going to have less empathy, your confidence is going to go down, you're going to just feel more anxious and paranoid, um, you're, actually your vocal tone will get more negative. So all of that just because your sleep, your, your sleep debt's increasing. And so, you know, while your objective performance, if you can measure it, is getting worse, your subjective feeling of, of how you're doing actually stays the same. Um, so it's really, really, really hard to, uh, to, to understand this problem. Now, you know, really wrapping this up, there's so many things out there with sleep. Likely, probably everyone in this room has spent money on something that has to do with sleep. Maybe, actually, everyone has. Mattress, pillows, uh, you know, maybe you've bought melatonin before. Maybe you're on a, a, using an app right now to, to listen to sounds before bed. Um, all sorts of tools. I think it's something like $100 billion Americans spend every year. Um, on, on just sleep aids. Now, all of that really doesn't work. None of that stuff will affect how you perform, how you feel, how long you live, all of the benefits we talk about. Um, it's really just your sleep debt that matters. Now, all of those things, I, I don't want to be so uh, out there, those things do matter so long as they support your sleep debt. So to give you an idea, um, you know, should I go buy a new mattress or not? Well, if you're up and your back's really hurting and you're waking up and so you're not getting enough sleep, and as a result of that, your sleep debt's increasing and a mattress is going to be more comfortable so that you can just get, be asleep longer, then yes, a mattress will help. But it's not, we, there's no science that shows that, you know, some fancier mattress that's slightly more comfortable that uses some new ingredient is going to, you know, magically change. It's not going to change, doesn't change your sleep debt. It's not going to change how you perform. So that idea, that simple idea, hopefully as you leave today and as you go back to wherever you are in the world and as you go back to, to your families and as you go back uh, to your coworkers, you know, if there's one idea, it's sleep debt. And there's a lot of myths around, well, can you pay this back? Can you not? Happy to talk about that deeper uh, in Q&A as well. All right. So let's transition here to um, really what this looks like in a business setting. So we just talked about sleep debt but we're all interested in trying to help people perform at their best. How do we help them be engaged? How do we help them be happy at work and at home? How do we help people be fulfilled? Um, and so what I wanna do is share with you a case study that we just wrapped up with a large Fortune 200 sales team. Now, why a sales team? Um, and it's just really because we can measure the business impact. It's not that it's not important for uh, an engineering team or a design team or a marketing team or an ops team um, it is. It's just that many times um, in those organizations, it's very difficult to have very precise, repeated measurements like you might in a really, really large sales team. And so uh, we were approached by uh, a, a Fortune 200 sales team that really had this problem. How do we grow next year's revenue by $1.5 billion? It's a big number. Uh, they do $16 billion in revenue a year. They've got 3,000 salespeople. Uh, and... What do you do? Do you increase sales capacity and hire a bunch more people? Do you figure out new tools to implement? Do you change up training? Do you, you know, change up your, your marketing mix? What do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you tackle this problem um, when you've got everything else happening too? And so um, I just want to actually show you the slide that I presented to 25 sales managers uh, that ended up implementing Arise with their teams. And what I shared with them was the following, hey, if we can work together and help your sales reps get 40 minutes more per night, just 40 minutes more per night, uh, that will lead to $2,500 more revenue per week. And that was based on their quota numbers. Now per month, that would be $10,000 increased revenue per month. Um, and that quickly adds up when you've got 3,000 salespeople, uh, adds up pretty quickly and, and takes a big chunk out of that billion and a half number that, that, that um, this head of sales needed to hit. 
So let's, I just want to give you a quick hit of the solution here. As David mentioned, um, you'll see a couple logos of teams that, that, we, that we work with. Um, now, we're, again, the focus is really on supporting high-performing businesses today. Um, but the, the quick idea on the solution is it's an app that you download. Um, we're able to actually tell you how much sleep that you have. We can identify how much, what your sleep need is, and then ultimately put together a very specific plan to help you reduce that sleep debt. Um, on top of that, I think it's worth mentioning lots of, I'm sure about probably one in one and two, uh, about half of you in the audience maybe have some sort of regular sleep issue, um, something like, you know, your mind's active at night and you have difficulty, um, you know, just waking up in the morning and feel super groggy. Maybe you need like, you know, five cups of coffee to get your day started. Um, about 20 pretty common issues that will also uh, have uh, some, some very specific science-backed approaches to help solve. Um, the way this worked with um, this particular team was we went in for a Monday morning sales meeting, presented basically the importance of sleep and its impact on performance, not so uh, different than what we just talked about around sleep debt. Um, from there, all the coworkers were given the opportunity to download Rise. They would answer a couple questions about what issues they had. Um, we would analyze all the motion data on their phone of going back uh, actually many, many years, which is crazy to even think about, but Apple stores about five years of your motion data. And from that, we have some uh, analytics that are able to basically tell what your sleep patterns are. Um, from there, we can tell you how much sleep debt you have, um, and that, at that moment, get you, you know, basically on a plan to help you start reducing that, depending on what the issue is. Um, and then over time, as life ebbs and flows, and as you sort of lapse and relapse uh, with, with sleep, which I think we can all, all relate to, whether you're traveling or you're out late uh, during the week at a, at a social function or, you know, a uh, friend's birthday party on, uh, during the weekend, your sleep debt goes way up and down, and so um, we're there always in the background to help you out, get you on the right plan, depending on your situation. Now, the problem, again, the business problem was like, how do we really prove that it's the, the sleep improvement that's leading to this change in sales performance, right? Because the sales team is also changing a bunch of other things about how they do sales. So they're changing training, the reps are getting better, um, you know, all that going on. And so how do you, uh, the, the problem is really, how do you solve for attribution? Um, and so we brought in a third party statistician that specializes in this area. Um, and we analyzed 93 reps over eight months in a controlled trial. Ultimately what we found is a 14% increase in monthly revenue per rep. So about double what we had predicted um, in, at, at, the, at the offset. That, and for their quotas, it was about 18,700 in revenue per month per person that was on this. And to give you a little bit of a deeper dive here, you can see, um, you know, basically these three months were before Rise started, but you can see the Rise group did slightly outperform, but these differences aren't statistically significant. And then the, the, the month after Rise started was the very first month that those two groups started uh, performing differently. Obviously, the Rise group selling significantly more per month, and you can see that difference just kind of continue to sustain after. And so it's sort of like a performance enhancing drug. While you're using the app and your sleep debt's lower, um, everything's good and your performance is higher. And then if you're not using it, your sleep debt typically goes up because you're less aware, you're not, you're not on a program, um, it's not something that's top of mind. And as a result of that, you know, all, all those performance attributes go down. Now, the business side of this is really interesting, compelling, and, and, and tons of fun to think about. But the reason that we all get up to work every day and why I've been spending the last eight years of my life uh, working on this problem is knowing that we can get up, come to work, and every single day help someone else get their sleep debt lower, solve a sleep issue, and ultimately feel better at work, at home, and really change the types of, uh, of relationships you can have you know, all, all throughout your life. And so really what's most important to us is that we saw you know, almost nine and a half out of 10 of those reps felt like they were more productive at work because of this. I, I didn't mention the stat around being at home too, but there's some amazing stories of how relationship changed with their partner and how they, were, they felt like they were a better, uh, a, a better um, parent to their kids and how they were nicer to their coworkers, uh, how they were nicer to the prospects they were talking with on the phone during sales meetings. Um, that sort of stuff just makes us uh, get really, really excited. Uh, nine out of 10 felt like this, the, the company offering this really helped them feel more valued. Obviously really important when they're thinking about, you know, how do we recruit and retain, retain um, the best talent? And then eight out of 10 felt like they would be, would be very disappointed if Rise was discontinued. Now I can guarantee you before this, I don't think, you know, a program to improve sleep was at the top of any of your lists. Uh, and, and had a budget for it. Uh, but what's really clear about this is, is that this sleep is one of the most impactful. You care about improving your people. It's really one of the most impactful investments you can make. 
in your people. It has the most science behind it. And ultimately, it's something that affects everyone. And it's something that everyone's already doing. And so making changes there, even if they're small, can have really, really material, dif- uh, material impact, both uh, at business you know, and, and at home. So I'm going to put my, my sales hat on for a moment here and say, if this is something you're interested for your team, um, definitely feel free to send me a note. Just say, hey, I uh, thought that was interesting. And we'll get a 20-minute call set up and see if, if that makes sense. But from here, I want to make sure that we've got some time to transition into Q&A. Thanks a ton for the, the, the time and attention. All right, Jeff. Uh, so first question is, so we gave everyone the sleep mask that uh, you told me to buy, and I think everyone <laughs> bought them. And these Alaska Bear sleep masks, do these work? Or is it placebo? Yeah, yeah. So do they work? So there's really three big ideas. We'll talk about environment. There's three big ideas when, and things you can do when it comes to actually helping you get to stay asleep longer, which ultimately helps you reduce sleep, sleep debt and get all those outcomes. Um, so you want to be thinking about your room being cool, dark, and quiet. Now, by dark, it really needs to be dark, meaning if you can tell in your room in the morning that the sun came up, far too much light. And so why these sleep masks work so well? One is I think we've tried 150 of them at this point, and uh, you know, trying to get Dwayne Wade to wear a sleep mask, it's got to be pretty comfortable. But we've just tried so many of them, um, and these ones work really well. They have a nose baffle, lots of reasons why, but there's also really strong research behind having darkness at night and so you'll notice that when you put on your that sleep mask if you haven't worn one before give it two three nights but you will just sleep far longer than you than you're used to before um, and and it's you'll you'll immediately notice the, the the difference now you might feel a bit groggier in the morning um just right when you wake up but give yourself an hour and a half really before you start to judge how you might feel great so the first question on uh, that's uh, trending high on slido is uh, Jeff mentioned that everyone needs a different amount of sleep based on genetics. How can we determine how much sleep it is that we need? So it's a great question. A um, couple different ways of doing it, ranging from like really expensive and costly to, to kind of just like more simple, and obviously the accuracy will, will, will change. Um, in the Rise app, we're able to analyze a bunch of data, and we have an algorithm that does it for you. But if you don't have that, um, what can you do? So think about a time that you were on vacation when uh, you didn't have to be up early in the morning, you didn't have to go to bed at a particular time, and think about a time when it was maybe like a you know, week-long vacation. About how long did you, were, were you sleeping? Was it seven and a half hours? Was it eight and a half hours? Now, you need to make sure that your environment is, is really uh, you know, well done as well, but so long as your environment is cool, dark, and quiet, um, you know, really start to think about what that number is, and that's probably close to what you're sleeping, uh, what, what it is. Um, so, you know, but again, seven and a half to eight and a half, you're going to be somewhere in that range. I'm personally eight and a half hour deep. Got it. And, uh, so we, t- uh, for someone who travels a lot, you know, they just sometimes take sleep aids. So one of the question is, does medication assisted sleep get the same results? And what are your thoughts on assisted sleep and impact on performance is less sleep or medicated sleep better? So this is a great question, and there, it's actually not quite clear exactly what the answer is. So let me tell you what we do know. What we do know is anything that you take uh, externally, let's say uh, that the body's not naturally producing. So melatonin is a thing that the body naturally produces. But let's say you're taking Ambien or you're taking, uh, you know, it's alcohol, it's common, common sleep aid, common sleep aid. Um, anything that you take that it, the body isn't naturally producing actually changes this, what's called your sleep architecture. So the stages of sleep that your brain goes through, and all that we know is that it really, really changes that stuff. Now, we don't exactly know how does a change in sleep architecture lead to a change in performance. That's the question still being figured out. But what we do know is that it's, a very, it's not naturalistic sleep that you're getting when it's assisted with some sort of sleep aid. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting research uh, you know, around how, how harmful some of those sleep aids actually can be, um, even though it's kind of the first go-to thing that, that a doctor might prescribe. Got it. And, and what ab- uh, about, uh, people are curious, what is your nightly routine for uh, amazing sleep? Well, maybe pre, pre-baby and post-baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually quite similar. They just shifted earlier. So what I do is about an hour and a half before bed, my wife and I both throw on these orange funky glasses. I'll actually show you here. Um, and what these do is they block out all blue light. Now, blue light uh, comes from every light source. So the, this window right now doesn't look blue, but I'm actually getting blue light or if I'm showering at night. And anytime you get light, it actually tells your brain to stay awake. 
I've got a nice, uh, let's see, graph over here. Let's see if we can find it. Um, fun graph. So the second thing I didn't cover, and if I had more time, we could go into it, is what's called the circadian rhythm. But I want to show you this graph. Anytime you get light, um, it actually tells your brain to stay awake. And so if you're getting light at night, um, your brain is going to reduce the amount of melatonin that it produces. And, you're, and for all, melatonin is, isn't just a sleep hormone. It does all sorts of things like anti-cancer properties. It's actually the, most, the body's most powerful antioxidant. Um, but basically, you won't produce that melatonin. So uh, here's actually an eye. There's a sensor in the eye that they discovered uh, about 10, 15 years ago that all it does is pick up uh, blue light. And so what these orange glasses do, and I'd highly recommend you get them, and I'm happy to send out a link uh, to, to, to David to send out to all of you, um, is I put these on, um, and then I'll do typically my, I'll organize my wind down routine where I do my most kind of stressful stuff first. So if it's like doing dishes or maybe helping um, put down, uh, put down Clara, my, my, uh, my newborn, my newborn, or maybe it's, you know, I need to get, get some important work stuff done. I get that done at the beginning and I save the end of my routine for stuff I really, really enjoy. So uh, for me, there's one evidence-based thing that I recommend others try, which is taking a really hot shower. So oftentimes I'll, you know, shower during the day and actually clean, but I actually use a hot shower at night as a way to, uh, uh, start to wind down. What the reason that works effectively is your body um, sort of overreacts to the heat in the shower, and when then when you get in bed, your body's trying to cool you down, and the process of cooling you down actually will help you um, get to sleep a little bit faster. Obviously, I throw on my eye mask as well. Uh, that's that's an every night thing. I like that idea about that hot shower. Um, okay. Hot shower, wonderful. You mentioned Claire. Uh, so someone says, "I have a 16 month old who hasn't started reading your research yet." Unfortunately, uh, high performer, but not super high performer. Any advice for parents who need to maintain high performance but don't have control over uh, sleep patterns? Oh, man. So I've got like 30 seconds, I think, or 20 seconds to answer this. Um, so the main thing you know, with, with kids is all of the things that we talked about environmentally, cool, dark, quiet, the sleep mask, the glasses, the same thing is true for kids. The same thing is actually true uh, in vitro, believe it or not. So I actually had my wife, before Clara was even born, putting on the orange glasses so that the circadian system could develop in vitro. Clara was sleeping through the night by week 10, which has been amazing. Um, but we implemented all these techniques. So we've also got uh, basically the, the same type of glasses for Clara, although we have, the way that we do that is we have a special red light in her room, so she's not getting that light. We have special blackout shades, so it's perfectly dark. Um, and that process uh, and, and having that wind down routine are things that you can do. Of course, there's way, way, way more on that topic, and it would depend on the specific issues you're dealing with. Um, but those are some general pieces of advice. The same things that work for you also work for them. Well, so we'll, uh, we have a couple more minutes, but, and I will say that uh, if this um, rise thing doesn't work for uh, sales teams, then I, I think you could be a, a, a baby coach uh, doctor to get more sleep, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, what about naps? Uh, is supplementing your sleep with a nap beneficial or not? Because in some cultures, they take naps during lunch at the work environment, and others, they don't. Uh, yeah, so how do naps work? So the way that they... The, the, the simple idea is, okay, do naps affect sleep debt? In this case, you'd say, yeah, they do. It's a, it, they actually affect it. Um, what's really interesting is naps can be effective because they affect it more oftentimes than sleep at night. Uh, now, two recommendations on naps. You should either take a 15 to 20 minute nap called a power nap. Believe it or not, one of our closest sleep science advisors uh, led what's called the uh, fatigue countermeasures group at NASA. Yeah, this is what, what it's called, fancy name. They study napping. Uh, so what they found is napping is important and you can do two types of naps. One is this power nap. And the reason that that can be effective is it, it'll have, uh, sort of the attention effects is three is I think uh, the equivalent of about three cups of coffee, but you don't have the, the, the dip and you have way better sustained learning effects. So even 15, 20 minutes is amazing when we, you know, used to do, when I used to do a lot of work in the NFL and, and in college, uh, you know, college sports, we often have uh, send these foam mattresses a little gift that a coach could roll up under his desk and, and, and sleep because those guys get like two, three hours a night. It's just crazy. Um, but naps are highly, highly effective um, and something that I would, I would recommend you know, early in the day. But there are some cases where naps aren't useful and also uh, something that maybe we could talk about uh, another time. Okay. So last question is uh, 
For those of us and our employees who struggle to shut our brains down when we're going to sleep, even when we're tired, any tricks yeah. to help us do that? 100%. So there's a, uh, there's a couple science-backed approaches to do this. Um, it turns out meditation and sounds um, are, are, while they're widely used, if you go in the app store, they actually don't uh, have great evidence behind uh, their efficacy. There are a couple things that do help. Um, one is, you know, having this wind down routine, like I mentioned, the orange glasses, having the right environment, so that'll help. But in terms of the active mind, there's really one thing that I found to be most effective and, and has some pretty good science behind it. Um, and it's just the idea of before you're, and this is something I'll typically do on the earlier part of my wind down. So, you know, an hour and a half before I might do it an hour in is if my, if I notice there's a lot of things going on in my mind, which there usually is, um, I'll take out my phone and I just write those things down. Um, some of, sometimes it's more specific and tactical to do's. A lot of times it's just like, man, you know, this conversation I had at work gave me a lot of anxiety or, Hey, you know, this thing I'm working on, I'm just really having, I'm just really struggling with. So whatever it is that's in your head, get it down. What's really interesting, um, you can actually test how well this works for you. If you have any, uh, if you ever have a song stuck in your head, if you try repeating or finishing the song, it'll leave your head. Um, so same is true with these ideas. If you haven't finished these tasks, your brain puts them on repeat until you do. And so documenting them uh, somewhere is a way of doing that. So same thing, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you've got stuff running through your mind, just being able to pull out a phone or notepad and just jot whatever it is down um, and knowing that it'll be there for you when you wake up, it go goes a really, really long way. Wow, Jeff. So thank you so much for enlightening all of us. Uh, big round of applause for Jeff. Hey, thank you so much. This was really, really a pleasure. Uh, please contact him at Jeff at Rise Science uh, if you want to learn more. Appreciate it, Jeff. Uh, cheers. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Sleep well.